Well, today is Father's Day. It's a special day for me, and not just because I'm a father, and not just because tomorrow I'm going on vacation. <laughs> it's also a great day, by the way, when I woke up this morning, totally aside, when I woke up this morning and it was raining, I was going, cool, I don't have to compete against golf. Why is it that on Mother's Day, when the mothers get to decide what they want to do, the place is packed, and on Father's Day, there's a lot of empty seats. We'll get back to that. So it's not because I have the privilege of preaching this morning. It's a special day because it was on this day, Father's Day, 14 years ago, that I was introduced to my Heavenly Father. Our daughter Sydney was nearly a year old. It was my first Father's Day. I had to wait almost a whole year to celebrate Father's Day, and she was born in July. I was a paramedic at the time, and I was doing landscaping as well, and it was through landscaping that we met some folks who invited us to go to Father's Day at their church. So I came home, and I told Tracy that I wanted to go to church for Father's Day. Now, this not may seem, this may not seem terribly unusual to you as I stand here this morning, but at the time, it was very unusual. You see, I couldn't have been further from a churchgoer. Not that I wasn't a necessarily bad person, hadn't killed anybody, hadn't stolen anything, didn't commit adultery, I was a nice guy, at least most of the time. And so I thought I had pretty much captured the essence of the Ten Commandments pretty well. I was just doing my thing, living my life, and trying to make it in this world. The reason I was also far from a churchgoer is that I was raised Jewish. I had gone to temples since I was a little boy. I had been bar mitzvah. Now here I was asking my Episcopalian wife to go to church. At the time, I had absolutely no indication that it was the Holy Spirit that was truly drawing me. I was actually only thinking of myself. I'm a father. I want the whole experience of the Father's Day, and if the church was going to celebrate me, I was going. But on that day, something happened. It was something I couldn't explain. It wasn't anything that I was after, but it was after me. The truth about a father I had always desired to know, but had no idea how to engage. And that's our Heavenly Father. And at that moment, not only did I see our Heavenly Father for who He is, but I saw for the very first time the Son that I was called to be. Last week, Ethan did a brief poll where he started his sermon. I'm going to try that once again. Okay, who here is a father? Raise your hands. Very good. All right, now, this is the hard one. Who here has a father? or at least at some point in their life, did. Come on, that really should be all of us. <laughs> Guys are killing me this morning. But as far as I know, a father is still required in one form or fashion for, uh, for children, although society is telling us they're less and less important. So while we normally speak of fatherhood on Father's Day, I'm going to mix it up a bit, and I'm going to speak about being a child. Let's pray. Father, you truly are the Heavenly Father. Lord, on Father's Day, we seek to celebrate our earthly dad. And Father, that is correct and true. You have knit our families together. There are no mistakes. But Father, on this day, my heart seeks you as a child. And Lord, I just ask that every word that I speak not be of me, but truly be of you. For Father, I have no wisdom to offer, but we know that all wisdom comes from you. Lord, I just ask that you would move in a powerful way here. Holy Spirit, you drew each person here, and Father, just like you drew me 14 years ago, Lord, I 
pray that if there's somebody here who doesn't know you, Lord, that you are going to reveal your truth to them, not because I am right, not because I know what I'm talking about, not because my words have any impact at all, but because you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Holy Spirit, have your way here amongst us now. Give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. John, can pray with you? You can say that again. Yeah, he's irreplaceable. <laughs> <laughs> Our story is not a secret. We were just little tiny babies. We didn't have a father. We were fatherless. I don't really remember it very much. Me either. We were pretty young. But we were adopted into a loving family. Is it, is it there we go. Okay. Well, we'll find some way to make this work. And it's back. All right. Thank you. Well, my apologies. So this morning I titled the message, Whose Child Are You? Uh, the working title of this message was, Who's Your Daddy? I just didn't quite think that that was going to look right on the board out front. We're, we're not that kind of church. So I just didn't think. It, it's an interesting question, though, isn't it? Whose child are you? This is going to stick with me. Who's your daddy? From the world's perspective, it's a really important question. Whose child are you? The world values family identification. Sometimes it's viewed positively, 
like in the area of business. And John, if you can pick up, pick up or put up that first picture. This is the Rockefeller family. Now, it's a very big family. Why is that? Because if you were even remotely related to the Rockefellers, you would want to be identified with the Rockefellers. And so you'd probably make your middle name a Rockefeller in some particular way. But in the area of business, identifying as a Rockefeller means something. Skip, can you put up, or John, sorry about that, John. Can you put up the next picture? This is the family of Billy Graham. Again, if you were one of Billy's children, you'd identify positively as being a part of the Graham family, and they've all done amazing things. However, on the other side, how would you feel about having this guy as your family member? That's Dylan Roof, Roof, the one who killed nine black Christians at the Emanuel AME Church in South Carolina. How many of you are interested in identifying with him right now? Even the judge at the bail hearing acknowledged that the family of Dylan Roof is one of his victims. Speaking of the victims of this horrible action, it was amazing for me to hear from the families of those who were killed. It was not lost on me that this occurred in a church. These were Christian brothers and sisters, and they were murdered. Yet their families did an amazing thing. They extended forgiveness to the killer. At the bond hearing, the families had a chance to speak, and all who did spoke spoke of forgiveness. Anthony Thompson, representing the family of Myra Thompson, spoke these powerful words. I forgive you. My family forgives you. We would like you to take this opportunity to repent, confess, give your life to the one who matters the most, Christ, so he can change your ways no matter what happens to you, and you will be okay. Do that and you'll be better off than you are right now. Now, I'm not going to enter the fray of what has unfortunately become political football other than to say I was greatly encouraged by the true expression of Christ's love that these families had and a great sadness that the focus has been on anything less than the remarkable work of forgiveness that they extended. However, perhaps the greatest identity crisis that has ever come forth came from the great theologian, you put up the next picture, Darth Vader. <laughs> Luke, I am your father. It's not exactly the words that Luke was interested in hearing. In fact, what was Luke's response? John, you put that picture up. Right? Screams out, no, you cannot be my father. What's uh, interesting is I was looking to get these pictures online. Um, people do some funny things. And uh, John, if you can put up that next picture. <laughs> I just, there are all sorts of really funny ones. You want to Google the images on this. It's actually, they're, they're pretty funny. But this truly is the world's perspective. They have something right, though. Who we identify as our family is important. Like most things, however, the world is surely askew. In Matthew 12, 48, in response to his disciples telling Jesus that his family is outside and wanted to see him, said these words. Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he pointed to his disciples and said, Look, these are my mothers and brothers. Anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Amen. You know, we read those words without the benefit of the historical and religious context. We read that and say, Cool, I'm Jesus' brother, I can deal with that. But hang on. If you thought that family identification means something to you and it means something in this world, then let's take a look what it meant back then. Back then, one's complete understanding of who they were was wrapped into who their family was. 
Remember that the Jewish tribes were there. To be a Levite meant that you were set apart and a caretaker of the covenant. To be a Kohen was to be as a direct descendant of Aaron, and you were a priest by birth, in the same way that lineage of the crown of England and other countries operates to this day. If your father was a fisherman, you were a fisherman. If he was a carpenter, you were a carpenter. In fact, your, e your name even reflected your lineage. My Hebrew name is Yehuda ben Aharon, Jeff, son of Alan. I'm identified as my father's son. So when Jesus says, who is my brother, who is my mother, this has, must have truly blown the disciples away. It was radical. But Jesus didn't leave it there of asking that question. He tells us who his family truly is, those that do the will of his father. Jesus sees that the identification was important. His family are those who identify with his father, the heavenly father. In his letter to the Galatians, the apostle Paul puts it this way in Galatians 3.26, for you are all children of God. And so this is the way the world sees it and says, yeah, it sounds right. If there's a God, then surely he would call me his child. God is love. That's true. God surely loves his creation. Again, that's true. So I'm a child of God. Sounds good. But something's missing here, isn't it? John, can you put up the entirety of Galatians 3.26? For you are a child of God through faith in Christ Jesus. It's through our faith in Christ Jesus that we are called children of God. In John 1, 12, But to all who believe him and accept him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from the human passions or play, but a birth that comes from God. Being born again, the birth that comes from God, gives us rights as heirs with Christ as his children. Not simply that we are his creation, therefore we have right standing before him. He loves all, yes, but he doesn't call us all his children until we identify with his son. So if those who have placed their faith in Christ are children of God, whose children are those who have not placed their faith in Christ? Be a fair question. And I'm glad you asked. In John 8, Jesus told them, If God were your father, you would love me, because I have come to you from God. I am not here on my own, but he sent me. Why can't you understand what I am saying? It's because you can't even hear me. For you are the children of your father the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He, was always, he has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it's consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Jesus is speaking to the religious leaders who are planning on putting him to death. When Jesus speaks to them regarding his father and their father, they respond that their father originally is Abraham. And Jesus' response is, well, if you were children of Abraham, then you would do as Abraham does. Yet they were determined to kill Jesus. So then their response was, well, their father is God himself. It's then that Jesus drops the bombshell. You are children of your father, the devil. So I ask you again, and I ask me again, Whose child am I? How do you know? Well, a few verses earlier in John, in John 8, 31, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But we are descendants of Abraham, they said. 
We have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean you will be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is part of the family forever. So what Jesus is saying here is that in order to be set free, you must know the truth. And the truth is found in being a true disciple of Christ. One who is no longer a slave to sin, but a true son of God. This is certainly not to say that we don't sin. There's a difference between what we would refer to as the temporary insanity of a follower of Christ and the pattern of sin, the slave to sin. Paul puts it very plainly in the letter to Corinth. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. And I will be your father, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Unfortunately, the church, primarily in the West, in Europe, in America, is shot through with too many slaves and not enough disciples. We're just as guilty of touching filthy things. We no longer call out sin. We've come to glorify it. The church itself now calls righteousness by a new name, being judgmental. And we wonder why we are neutered as followers. Let me ask you a question. Do you feel much like the revered child of God? Do you feel powerful, courageous, anointed, pure, righteous? Do you even feel forgiven? Last week, Ethan spoke about the importance of having a testimony. Do you have one? Dennis Prager. Dennis Prager is a Jewish theologian and author and a radio talk show host. Uh, for those of you who went to the movie uh, The Exodus, he was one of the panel members. And recently, uh, on one of his radio shows, they were talking about the problem of radical Islam. And he had a guest on, and he asked the guest, how is it possible that radical Islam is able to take young American men and radicalize them. It's a question I've heard often asked. It's a question that I've thought about and pondered myself. And yet the, interest, the answer was interesting. George Barna, the Christian pollster, and Ken Ham, the uh, founder of uh, Answers in Genesis, in his uh, book, Already Gone, why the quit kids quit the church, those two were asking essentially the same question, except in reverse. Why is it that two-thirds of young adults leave the church when they go off to college? The answer for them is an indoctrination of secular colleges. The answer isn't to drive for worldly success or anything out there. The answer to both of the questions as to why young men are being radicalized into destruction and the reason why young people are leaving the church is the same. And it's one word. Passion. Young men and young women are seeking something to believe in. Something to be passionate about. And young Christians just don't find passion and purpose in the Christian life. No passion in their homes, no passion in their youth group, no passion in the church. The truth is that these studies find at the time students reach middle school, over 50% of them question the validity of the scriptures. Why is that? Are they doing exhaustive interlinear studies? Have they parsed the science journals and compared modern scientific techniques to the Word of God? The answer is clearly not. They just don't, simply don't see the point. They don't see passion. Something worth standing up for. Something worth suffering for. Something worth dying for. We've allowed the world to define the church. 
rather than allowing the word of God to define who the church is and let the world mock us, persecute us, martyr us, and then allow the victory of our suffering with Christ to be our testimony. We can come to church and sing songs of praise and perhaps raise a hand and say amen. But is that passion? Is that victory? And is that freedom? You know, I ask myself these same questions. You know, getting up here and giving a sermon is not an easy thing. You know, Ethan brought that to the fore last week, saying how much he was under attack and his wife was under attack for the weeks leading up. And my wife and family and I have recognized that there are crazy attacks that come when I come before you as well. And the last couple of weeks have certainly been no exception. When we step into a place of obedience, we are poking our finger into the eye of the enemy. We should expect the attacks. But what I've found is that it's not the attack that robs the passion out of me. It's when I submit to the attack that my passion is sucked out like a pop balloon. Well, it's Father's Day. And of course, what Satan's going to do is I'm preparing my message is to go right at the heart of me as a father. This week, this past week, had me sitting with my entire family nearly in tears, expressing my complete failure as a father. It was like Satan had lobbed a hand grenade into the middle of my living room, and I was all too willing to stack my children and my wife with an extra sense of effort on top of that grenade and realized we had all got blown up by it. It was not easy. The repercussions of that engagement lasted far too long and hurt far too much. My point this morning is that I'm not a terrible father. It's not that you should feel bad for me or more appropriately for my wife and kids. In a moment of weakness, my flesh was overcome by anger, not love. Bitterness, not joy. Frustration, not peace. Irritability, not patience. You get the picture. My passion gave way to indifference. My purpose was reduced to selfishness. But church, I didn't stay there. We aren't all called to stay there. The Bible refers to being a child of God many times. In scriptures like Luke 6.35, you will be the sons of the Most High. In Romans 8, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Ephesians 1, Philippians 2, Revelation 21. And just a couple of weeks ago, as we've been going through the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. In Matthew 9, 22, Jesus says these remarkable words. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed from that moment. You may recall that this is the woman with bleeding who had suffered for 12 long years. She grabbed the hem of Jesus' garment, and Jesus turned and called her daughter. Why? I read that and went, why call her daughter? I believe that he called her daughter because this is a woman who sought Jesus with passion. She heard that he was there. She knew that to reach out to Jesus was to seek with everything within her soul the wellness that couldn't be found anywhere else. And so she fought through the crowds 
In other Gospels, you hear about the crowds that surrounded Jesus as he walked along the streets. And this woman plows through those crowds. And like others who were also reaching out to Jesus, she grabbed the hem of his garment. And why was it that he, Jesus, recognized her grabbing at the hem? We think about this as if Jesus is just walking by and she's the only one and just reaches out. She reached out to the hem of her, his garment because he, she couldn't get to any other part of him. There were too many people surrounding him. She's on her knees and reaches out and grabs the hem of his garment. And Jesus recognizes that something happened, that there was somebody who was reaching out for him right then. It wasn't all the other people who were crowding around him who were probably touching at his head and his body and everything else. It was her. Because she had passion. Likewise, in Matthew 2, we read about the man who was paralyzed so desperate to see Jesus that his friends cut a hole in the roof and lowered the man to Jesus. What a scene. Verse 5 says this. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. He called him Son. The man was desperate for Jesus. His faith, his passion led him to do extraordinary things. And Jesus calls him Son. Both the man and the woman were desperate to be well. They weren't just looking to be healed. They were looking to be well. Am I that desperate? Am I that passionate for Jesus? Are you? Are you living the life worthy of being called a child of God? I want to leave you. I want to challenge you as I've challenged myself. In 1 John 3, 1 through 10. See how very much our Father loves us, for He calls us His children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are child's, God's children because they don't know Him. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but He has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like Him, for we will see Him as He really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure, just as he is pure. Everyone who sins is breaking God's law, for all sin is contrary to the law of God. And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins, and there is no sin in him. Anyone who continues to live in him will not sin. But anyone who keeps on sinning does not know him or understand who he is. Dear, dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. But when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil, who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. incredibly challenging. To be called a children of child of God, to be called son, to be identified as a child of the one true living God, is there anything greater? Is there anything with more purpose? Is there anything that we should be more passionate about? And church, I've been challenged this week in the midst of the trial to remain faithful and true and passionate about the one true thing. Because if we lose our passion for the one true thing, then we will have passions. But those passions will lead us to destruction. 
and it will destroy those who are around us. I think we are being called into a deeper place. Each one of us, and there may be some here who have not called upon the Lord Jesus. My prayer is it was in the beginning that the Holy Spirit is just continuing to reveal that truth to you and that you will be set free. We have freedom in that victory. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day. Father, I know that this was not an easy message. This was not an easy message for me. This was not an easy message upon my heart. And Father, I know that you are doing a mighty work. Lord, I come before you as a child. And I just ask you for your forgiveness to follow, to just reign over me. Lord, I just ask that the hearts of your children here, Lord, just seek you in a deeper way. There is nothing greater than the purpose becoming more like Christ. That's a work that we cannot do alone, and Father, it's a work that we need to acknowledge that you are the one who is doing that in us. I thank you, Lord, that we can be brought into a place where we can be called son, and we can be called daughter. We recognize, Lord, that you don't have grandchildren. We don't get to sneak in. All must come to you. Continue, Lord, to do your amazing work in and through each one of us. I thank you, Father, that you drew every person here. And, Lord, I just ask that your word would go forth in power and might. Just give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please uh, don't forget to see the Bonnies in the back about uh, Operation Christmas Child and us starting early and often with uh, that ministry. Also the uh, uh, Lost and Found. Um, if it remains lost, then it will be found at the doorstep of the Capital City Rescue Mission. And we also have tables of uh, free stuff over on the side as well. So, and Lord... Bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. And most of all, may you truly call upon him as Abba Father, as you are a child of God. There will be others of us uh, up here praying with you, and you may leave the chairs down. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day.